Um, hi, uh, good day everyone. Um, my name is Christina Conati and I'm very pleased to be part of this panel, although unfortunately I can't be there in person, but um, I'm still happy to have a chance to talk to you about uh, my research and specifically about effective user modeling to improve human-computer interaction. So I will start by giving a little bit of uh, context for my research. I um, work in adaptive user interfaces, and this is um, a fascinating interdisciplinary field that combines research in artificial intelligence, cognitive science, and human-computer interaction uh, with the goal of devising interfaces that can better support individual users by understanding what the user needs are and uh, autonomously and intelligently adapting to these needs. Um, in, in order to do so, obviously, uh, what the system needs to do, what the interface needs to do, um, is to understand what these needs are, and thus needs to create some sort of a representation of the user or a model of the user in real time during the interaction. Um, this part of research in adaptive interfaces is called user modeling, and uh, so more formally, that's the field that tries to uh, works on understanding how to efficiently infer, represent, and reason about non-trivial user features that are uh, necessary for adaptivity. And for non-trivial features, I mean features that cannot be easily obtained by, for instance, asking the user, such as the user's gender, age, um, and so on and so forth. But in the, we're talking about features that represent higher level traits that the system needs to infer from simple interaction events, such as keystrokes or mouse movements, for instance, and uh, what these features might be. Well, there has been quite a lot of research in user modeling to capture um, cognitive elements of the user, such as, for instance, a user's knowledge of the task domain, uh, the goals that may, the user might have during the interaction, his beliefs during the interaction. Um, so these are all very important things to capture, but my, um, the long-term uh, goal of my research is actually to try to extend the range of user features that can be captured in a user model to include more uh, like higher level features that could be, for instance, domain independent skills, also known as metacognitive skills, that represent um, reasoning and learning capabilities, such as, for instance, the capability of learning successfully from examples, of reasoning by analogy, of self-monitoring during uh, task performance, and also even more esoteric traits, such as affective states whereby affective states, we mean things like emotions, moods, motivation of the user during the interaction. And these are actually um, the traits that I'm going to focus uh, on today, and in particular on how to model user emotions during the interaction uh, with um, an interface. So how can we assess user emotions during the interaction with an adaptive system? Well, let's think about what um, you know, we humans do when we try to understand the emotions of our peers. Uh, one way to go is to actually reason about possible causes of emotional reactions. Um, that is, what is happening in the environment that might cause certain emotions in our interlocutor. Uh, for instance, if I see that an interface keeps interacting, interrupting a user, like for instance the paperclip in uh, Microsoft Word used to do, well then I could infer that the user might be frustrated. The other way to go is to actually to uh, look at the user and see what the user reactions are and use these reactions to actually infer what the emotional state could be. For instance, if I see that the user is punching the screen, well, you know, the chances are that the user is actually upset with the interface. Unfortunately, um, the mapping between causes, emotions, and their effects is not always so clear-cut. So the sources of information that I have are not always as obvious as, as the ones that I've just described. Um, different circumstances, for instance, so the same context might generate different reactions in different users, or even different reactions in the same user different times of the day, with the users changing moods and dispositions. Um, also, different users might have different ways of reacting to emotions. Some users can be very um, open about them and actually show emotional reactions very visibly with their behaviors. Other users might be a little bit more um, shy about showing their emotions and thus I can rea we cannot rely so much on observing their behaviors to understand what their emotions are. 
this is all to say that creating uh, effective user models is very hard. So it's very hard, and but why do we care? If it's hard, we could just not do it. Well, the assumption is that understanding user affect might actually uh, improve the ability of an adaptive interface to tailor the interaction to the needs of each individual user. And uh, although this might not be true for every possible kind of interaction, we believe especially true, it is true in certainly um, emotionally charged contexts, such as, for instance, uh, applications in e-health. And uh, Christina Lizetti, one of the speakers in um, the next panel, will talk a little bit about this. Um, applications um, that involve interactive games, and games we know are um, really emotionally engaging, that's your strength. And also applications, for instance, related to computer-based education, because learning is also a very, um, at times, emotionally taxing uh, task. And therefore, being able to understand the learner's emotions during the interaction with a computer-based um, system for education can be very important. And in fact, what I will uh, describe today is our uh, research on developing an effective user model for an application that combines the last two um, contexts, such as electronic games and computer-based education. Specifically, we'll be working on an effective user model for an educational computing game, computer game. And uh, so what I will do for the rest of this talk is to, first of all, describe a little bit <clears throat> what educational computer games are, then uh, describe the specific educational game we've been working on, it's called Prime Crime, uh, describe the effective user model that we have been uh, developing for this um, interface, for this application, with some results on you know, what we have achieved, and then wrap up with some future work and conclusions. So let's start by giving a little bit of a description of what educational computer games are and why they could be a good testbed for research in effective user modeling. So uh, educational computer games are educational systems that are uh, designed to teach via game-like activities. And they have uh, been the focus of quite a lot of interest in the last few years because uh, there is quite a lot of evidence that they generate a very high level of emotional engagement and motivation in learners. And therefore, they can keep learners on task much longer. And hopefully, you know, the idea is that learners would actually learn more by interacting with these very engaging tools. Unfortunately, there is evidence that not all learners uh, learn well with this particular educational tools because some of them actually get all um, sort of distracted by the game part of uh, the system and uh, they don't learn so well. So they basically learn to play the game without necessarily reasoning about the necessary domain knowledge and therefore don't learn much. Um, as an example, um, this is uh, Prime Climb. I'm going to talk a little bit about Prime Climb, the educational game that we've been using as a testbed for our research. Uh, this is a game that uh, was designed by the eGEMS group at our university and uh, is designed to teach, um, to help students learn number factorization and is designed for students in sixth and seventh grade, which in North America corresponds to a scuola media in Italy. Um, so we're talking about children that are 11 uh, to 12 year old. And the game is a collaborative game in which two players have to um, collaborate to climb a series of mountains. One is represented here on the screenshot. The, each mountain is divided into sectors uh, labeled with numbers. And the main uh, rule of the game is that uh, by moving on um, sectors that are labeled with numbers that don't share any common factor with the number um, that labels uh, the sector on which the other player is sitting. So for instance, in this screenshot, we see that there is the player that is higher up in the mountain is sitting on um, the sector labeled number nine. 
and uh, the player at the bottom can choose to move, for instance, on uh, the slide, the, the sector on the right that is labeled with number two or the sector labeled with number 19. This could be a good move because these two numbers don't share any common factor with nine. But if the player at the bottom chose to move to the left on the sector labeled with number three, three is a factor of nine. So this is an illegal move. The player would fall and the team would lose points. So the idea behind this, um, this game is that by having to reason about number factorization to climb up the mountain, students would actually practice this skill and become better um, at understanding number factorization. Um, and we ran some studies with the game and uh, it definitely worked well for some students. They actually improved their understanding of number factorization. But others actually did exactly what I was mentioning earlier. They basically learned to play by heuristics and by understanding patterns in the numbers, but not actually by understanding factorization better. And so they didn't learn much. And really, this is, I just want to emphasize that this is not a problem that we are, we were the only ones to find. This is exactly the same finding that different uh, researchers found with different games. So the idea is that there is a very strong uh, influence on, of individual um, learning capabilities in succeeding in learning from an educational game. Therefore, we could struggle to improve the design. Uh, but we believe that it's actually a, a, an alternative solution that might work better is to actually try to create emotional intelligent pedagogical agents that can monitor uh, during the interaction how a specific student is performing with the game, whether the student is learning or not. And if the student is not learning, they should be able to generate interventions that are tailored to this specific learner and to uh, her specific problems to trigger constructive reasoning when the learning is not doing it spontaneously. But the important thing is that they have to generate these interventions while still maintaining a high level of student emotional engagement, because what we don't want to lose what is the main advantage of educational games. And uh, we don't want to make these interactions too didactic, otherwise they will become normal educational tools. So this is a clear example of an interaction, of an interactive system in which is crucial for the interface to be able to have a model of student affect in addition of learning. Okay, so um, we have started designing uh, one of these pedagogical agents for Prime Climb. This, agents, uh, this agent provides hints to help students learn from the game uh, as the interaction proceeds. And the hints are based both on, currently the hints are based on a model of student learning that the system builds as the student interacts with the game. And could generate, uh, the agent is shown here and the screenshot on the right. And the agent says things like, for instance, if a student falls, uh, could say something like, uh, think about how to factorize the number to click on, you clicked on to actually trigger reasoning. Um, but what we want to do is to actually uh, also provide this agent with an understanding of a student emotional state at a specific point in time so that the agent can say things are a little bit more uh, emphatic, they're a little bit more empathic, such as, oh, I understand that you might be frustrated because you fail, but, you know, don't be discouraged. Just think about how to factorize the numbers you clicked on. So, um, that would be great, definitely would be a much nicer agent, but um, there is, you know, quite a, a big challenge. Uh, we already said earlier that um, building effective user models is hard. In this particular context, in the context of uh, an educational game, the difficulty in modeling affect is enhanced by the fact that the players often experience multiple emotions, possibly overlapping and changing rapidly during the interaction. Uh, for instance, at any given point in time, a student might be happy with herself because she performed you know, a correct move, but she might be um, upset with the agent because the agent you know intervened asking her to think about why the move was correct uh, so these are two like conflicting emotions that she might be experiencing at the same time uh, one positive and one negative and at the next move she might be making a mistake and then all of a sudden she would go from being happy with herself to be actually ashamed for having made a mistake so lots of multiple multiple emotions possibly overlapping um, 
so there is a lot of ambiguity in the modeling process. Um, previous approaches to creating um, effective user models have tried to reduce the complexity and the uncertainty in modeling affect by focusing on uh, modeling one specific emotion in a restricted situation, such as stress in driving uh, conditions, or only modeling lower level um, elements of uh, the affective state states, sorry, such as the intensity of the emotional uh, arousal and the valence, that is whether the person is, an, in a, is feeling a positive or a negative emotion without understanding which specific emotion the uh, person is feeling. Uh, but these approaches we feel are not ideal to generate precise effective interventions in the complex emotional context that is triggered by educational games. So, we've been trying to actually uh, take a different approach. Our solution includes uh, three main components. The first is to um, handle the uncertainty that it's present in the modeling task in a formal way by relying on a formal method for probabilistic reasoning. And specifically, we use Bayesian networks and their extensions. I won't go into any of the de technical details of our approach, but if you're interested, you can get in touch with me and I can give you references uh, in which we talk about the technical aspects of the work. Also, we try to integrate, to put in the model as much as many sources of information on the player's emotional reactions as we can. And in particular, we try to integrate information on both the co possible causes of the player emotional state and uh, effects of uh, her emotional reactions. Um, and also, we always try to base the design of our model on existing well-established theories uh, from emotional psychology, psychology, so that the model is uh, theoretically well-grounded. So here is a representation of the model, uh, high level. We have, as I said, I'm not going to go into any of the technical details for the sake of time. Uh, so we have a part of the model. Uh, the upper uh, box shows uh, represent the model has a representation of uh, possible causes of the player emotional reactions that are uh, defined in terms of uh, in terms of game situations, and these are used to generate a predictive assessment of the player's state emotional state. Then the mo the model also has a representation of current relevant player reactions that the model uses to generate some diagnostic assessment of the emotional state to be integrated with the predictive assessment. And um, as I said, we uh, base the model design on existing theories uh, from emotional psychology. And in particular, for the predictive assessment, we uh, base um, the model on the OCC theory of emotions from the name of um, uh, their, uh, its inventors, or Tony Clore and Collins. This theory defines uh, 22 different emotions that, um, and sees emotions always as the result of uh, a person evaluating the current circumstances in uh, with respect of one's goals. And uh, evaluating is also technically called appraising. So uh, let's just give an example in the context, for instance, of our educational game. Suppose that the player has certain given goals during the interactions, for instance, having fun or avoid falling. Uh, the agent performs an action that generates an outcome. That's the current circumstance. That's the current context of the game. The person looks at the outcome and uh, assesses whether this outcome is good for her goals, matches her goals or not. If the outcome matches the goals, the player feels joy towards this outcome, otherwise the player can feel distress. Another set of the emotions that can happen at the same time are emotions towards whoever generated the outcome, in this case, the agent. So if the outcome was positive for the player, the player will feel admiration towards the agent, otherwise the player will feel reproach. Another example, if it's the player itself that generates an action and therefore generates a new situation in the game, uh, again, the player will assess the current outcome of her action and provide, as before, joy or distress towards this outcome, depending on how that fits her goals. But at this point, because she was the one who generated the outcome, the emotions could be either pride or shame for herself, uh, depending, again, on the quality of the outcome. So these are six of the 22 emotions defined by this theory. There are actually many more, um, but they're not, uh, for now, we're not looking at those for our model. We are currently modeling only the six, uh, joy and regret, admiration and reproach, and pride and shame. 
and the model has mechanisms that allow it to infer the player goals in real time during interactions, such as if the player is trying to have fall or math, avoid falling, and also has information that allows it to assess which uh, game states are um, good or bad for specific goals to go from there to the assessment of the specific emotions. As far as player reactions are concerned, we're currently looking at only one type of reaction that relates to um, the player, uh, whether the player is actually doing things like frowning or raising their eyebrows. Um, and in order to detect these movements in the player's foreheads, we use a sensor that is called electromyogram, EMG. Uh, for brevity. And we use the sensor because from the literature, there are many studies showing that um, activity in the forehead, greater activity detected uh, via the EMG, is a reliable indicator of uh, negative affective reactions, while reduced activity is actually a good indicator of a positive affect. So in our model, we had um, information detected by using uh, placing EMG sensors on the foreheads of the players. And uh, this gave information to the model on the activity in the corrugator muscle. And the model uses this information to assess whether the player is in a positive or negative emotional state and integrates this information to finally better assess um, which of the six specific emotions the player is feeling. So um, we did some formal user studies, and again, I can give you references if you're interested. And we got very encouraging results. Uh, specifically, uh, as you can see in this chart, we reached uh, over 80% accuracy in modeling admiration, uh, almost 80% in modeling joy. So we're doing very well with positive emotions. Uh, we're not doing as well with um, admiration and reproach. They are slightly above and below 60%. Uh, but we feel that these are actually very promising results because it's a very difficult uh, modeling task. We are uh, among the first to try to model specific emotions in such a dynamic environment. So we're very pleased with our results. And we're actually, but there is also still a lot of room for improvement. So there's a lot of exciting future work that we are planning to do. Uh, for instance, we're planning to add more um, sensors to improve the model accuracy, such as, for instance, we're planning to add better expression recognition by using, for instance, uh, vision software, or even try to detect to use sensors that allow to detect speech and intonation patterns. Uh, then we obviously want to integrate the existing model of uh, student learning with the model of affect and have a comprehensive model uh, that then we will use to create the emotional intelligent agent that is capable of taking into account both the student affect and learning to decide how to act. This is a big research question because we know how humans act to um, uh, interface with others' emotions, but we don't really know how um, you know, interface agents should, what interface agents should do to actually uh, uh, fix and emo use play, play your emotional states when necessary. So this is a big research question and we're very, very excited about it. Um, and then finally, you know, very importantly, we need to prove that uh, our agent, emotionally intelligent agent, works better than an agent with no affect because ultimately what we need to do to be doing um, scientifically sound work, scientifically sound work is to prove that our assumptions that uh, modeling affect is important, um, we need to prove that that assumption is true. So conclusions. Um, I believe effective computing has great potential to improve human computer interaction. And I've given a little bit of a glimpse of what research we've been doing on a specific part of effective user modeling known as effective uh, user modeling. And um, also we have, um, it's an exciting, effective computing is an exciting multidisciplinary field that brings computer science together with other disciplines that have been traditionally more appealing for women, such as cognitive science and uh, cognitive psychology. Uh, I'm not sure if this means that women might be privileged in the development and use of the next generation of um, uh, interactive systems. This was a question that was uh, given to us as, um, you know, starting point when we were invited to this panel. Uh, so I'm not sure if we're privileged. I know a lot of male researchers were doing great, uh, you know, work in this field and they're enjoying it a lot. Um, I definitely know that I've been privileged in being able to be working in this field and I really hope that uh, more people will join because it's very exciting and there is a lot of potential to improve uh, our um, interaction with computers. 
So thank you a lot. Uh, thank you for your attention and um, have a great rest of the conference.